It's done. So good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? I tell you what, we're, uh, we're having some crazy technical difficulties this morning, so there is no stream, but we will be posting it. So if you talk to anybody who's not able to be here this morning, they're like, man, I, I, could, I couldn't find the stream this morning, let them know that it'll be up later on on uh, Facebook and YouTube and all that stuff. So it's just us here this morning, and we are so excited. We've got a beautiful backdrop to worship uh, the Lord in front of, and uh, thanks to, to Jason and Stephanie and all those who helped decorate and get that going. They've made it look great, haven't they? It's a winter wonderland in here. And uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to celebrating, in a, uh, hopefully next week, with the children's musical and all kinds of great things as a part of our celebration of Christmas. Uh, as you see around the room, we've got some candles set up that are in memory and in honor of, of several folks that are part of our church family. And uh, so I, I think we've still got a few more. If, we, if you'd like to still put one in, uh, just fill out one of the envelopes back on the Welcome Center and let us know about that, and we'll, we'll take care of you. We're so glad to have you here this morning. We're so glad for those of you that are visiting with us, some for the first time. Uh, we hope that you have a great time with us this morning, worshiping the Lord, hearing his word, and just being together with some great folks. So uh, we don't, in COVID times, we don't, uh, we're not able to do our welcome time like we used to, uh, but hopefully you'll get a chance to talk to each other and have a good time of fellowship just for a few moments as we wrap up our service in just a little bit. But in the meantime, let's get ready to worship the Lord together. Uh, and I'm going to ask Grayson to come up and lead our invocation this morning. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for what you've given us today. I thank you for allowing us to come to your house to worship. Uh, I thank you for who you are and what you've done for us on the cross and allowing, um, allowing your son to die for us. Um, I just pray that you would uh, bless this time that we have together and pray that you give Rich the words that, um, that would touch someone's heart. Uh, pray for those who can't be here with us this morning, uh, whether they be sick or uh, any other circumstances. And I'd like to pray for the dear family as they're going through this time of loss. And just um, let them know that you are Lord, the Lord and that um, this is all part of your plan and for your good. And just place your hand of um, comfort upon them. Um, pray for those who are sick and just pray for healing for them and um, allowing them to return with us as, as soon as possible. And I pray. Amen. You know, playing ball growing up, our coaches always said when somebody goes down, it's next man up. And uh, that used to sound like a fun thing, and probably did for you too, until now I get to lead you in musical worship this morning. Uh, so uh, you know that, that Glenn and Julie have made it to, uh, to Florida. We're so thankful that they had a safe move and everything went well, and they're getting settled in down there. And uh, Thomas was ready to, to, to lead for us, but then they had to quarantine, and they're going to be quarantined until, uh, until baby Reese is born here just in a few weeks. So praying for them, uh, and praying for y'all, because uh, you're going to have to sing really loud to overcome what's going on up here, all right? So, uh, but we're excited to get to at least give it a shot. Thankfully, God doesn't judge us on what our voice sounds like, amen? All right, some of you are with me. So let's begin our service singing this morning. We will sing, O Come All Ye Faithful. If you would stand with me as we sing the first verse. Amen, and please be seated this morning. Our ministry spotlight this morning with many things going on during the holiday season as we celebrate the birth of Christ and what he means to us in our lives. In fact, he being the giver of life to us. Uh, one of the great things we get to take part in as a Baptist church is to, to be a part of the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. The Lottie Moon Christmas offering is, is money that we give as God guides us to, uh, to support missions throughout our world. It is for international missions, and it supports so many, I mean, just thousands of missionaries that are going out day in, day out, week in, week out, throughout the year, serving Christ and sharing the gospel all over the world. We'd like for you to take a look. This video is about five minutes long. It's a little bit longer than normal, but I want you to, to see some of what, when we give to Lottie Moon, some of what God uses that money to do. So take a look at our screens. Nani ya mawaishi kwa na polisi? 
Nani amewahi kuliona chawa? Nani amewahi lala njaa kwa street? Nani amewahi dhurumiwa kimapenzi ama anajua mtu amewahi dhurumiwa uko street? Kudhurumiwa kimapenzi. Whenever I was hanging out with the boys, people would come to me and be like, you know these boys are dangerous, you know these boys are going to hurt you, you know you shouldn't be here. And they're just despised by everyone. Only a few understand that these are just normal children who have been forced to the streets with different circumstances. They're not loved. They're actively insulted and abused and kicked. Show them love and they will respond with love. Show them a bad attitude and they will repel from you. They are just children. In 2009, 2010, I was serving as a photographer with the International Mission Board. And one of my last assignments was a story on a young lady working with street kids in Nairobi, Kenya. I would spend from four in the morning to 10 at night with this group of 20 kids getting to know them, hearing why they were on the streets. And the whole time I was like, oh my gosh, the Lord is going to call somebody to work with these kids. Like somebody needs to come do something. So I finally just said, Lord, are you calling me to go work with those boys? And I had peace. Like I knew that that's what I was being called to do. Hopefully 13 boys will come to the shelter this morning um, and they'll be rescued off the streets. Honestly, there were so many years that I worked on the streets in Nairobi without a place to take boys. I would just get to know them and help them like in the small ways that I could. Um, and the fact that God has provided the shelter um, and given us opportunity to be rescuing kids off the streets and make a real difference in their life. It's really exciting. Like, life will not be the same for these boys. And Naivasha Children's Shelter, our mission is to rescue them from the streets, to help them to be rehabilitated, to get off drugs, to go through trauma counseling. And as much as we see that these kids need food and they need education and they need a bed to sleep in, they do, they need all of those things. But what they really need is the love of a family. They need to belong somewhere. They need to be well cared for. They need to know that they're loved. And we show them that through the love that the social workers give them here. We show them that by pointing to the love of Christ and we show them that by putting them back in their family where they belong with people who love them. One of our social workers, Elphis, has spent hours looking for one kid that's lost that he wants to be able to have a new life. Um, and it's not just Elphis, all of the social workers at the shelter are amazing. They go to the streets every day and every night they get to know the boys, they get to hear their story, know why they came to the streets, know what happened in their family, and offer them a way out. I talk to them, I make them understand that despite everything that you're going through, there is hope and there is someone who cares. That's why I'm here. I had seen enough of orphanages, I had worked with enough organizations that I knew the best place for any child is in their family. And we don't just take them home and drop them off. What we do is we spend a lot of time going to the family and finding out what sent that child to the streets? Was it the influence of peers? Was it poverty at home? And then spend a lot of time working on that issue with the family. Every child that's placed back at home, they follow them until they reach the age of 18 or they finish school. Just to make sure that child has no chance of going back to the streets, everything is fine, they have enough food, they're in school, they invest their lives in these children. I'm sure that these kids, if given a chance, and a place to make their lives, for sure they are going to change and make a better generation to come. I just want to sincerely say thank you. It is because of Southern Baptist that I am able to be here. The shelter is able to keep running. I'm able to serve in this way because of your gifts to the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering and the cooperative program. And it's miraculous to see a child that was alone living on the streets and hopeless reunited with their family. This is the model that works. This is what helps to get kids back home where they should be and where they want to be.
So much of what we celebrate at Christmas involves the joy of children. And uh, through whether it be Operation Christmas Child, as we participated in last month, and as we're excited to know that, that the gospel will be going out through small boxes of gifts all over the world, but also through the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, uh, we have an opportunity right here in Harrisville to impact children around the world. And you may say, well, I don't see how my money goes from here to there. And you know what? That's a matter of faith. That's a matter of trust. We believe in the IMB, the International Mission Board, that they do send that money to the missionaries that need it, resourcing them and supplying them what they need to be able to do the things like what we've seen this morning on the screen. I'd encourage you this week as we, uh, as we pray for the, uh, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, as we pray about what our part of that will be. Uh, we have our church goal, but what your part in, in, as an individual or as an individual family will be, uh, I'd encourage you to take a look. Just Google Lottie Moon Christmas offering, and you'll find their website. There's several more videos like that. We'll be playing a few more here the next couple of weeks, but, uh, but I'd encourage you to take a look at those, even daily. Uh, they have enough for a week there from a Sunday to a Sunday, uh, and maybe you would take this week to pray about how God would lead you to support uh, these missionaries in the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. God's given us so much. He's blessed us in so many ways, and we have so much here in our country. Even though our times, like the rest of the world, are tough right now, uh, the, he, we are still blessed financially in so many ways. And one of the great things he does when he blesses us that way is he gives us the opportunity to turn around and use those gifts to serve him and to draw people to him as well. Another way we get to do that at the first week of each month is we, uh, we celebrate our birthdays and our anniversaries here in our church family. And uh, one of the ways we do that is as we sing happy birthday and happy anniversary to you this morning, uh, we, we give you the opportunity, we invite you as you're led to come down and just give a little offering. This offering goes to help folks right here in the Harrisville community uh, right during this time of Christmas. So this month, if you've got a birthday or an anniversary and you'd like to give this morning, as you stand and as we sing together, uh, you come on down the aisle and uh, put your offering here in the little church bank. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. Amen. Now, please be seated. All right, we come to a time when we talk to our elementary guys and girls and give a chance to, to just to speak to them especially. And so all of you young guys and girls that are here with us this morning, we're glad that you're here. And uh, I know that this has been a crazy, crazy year. And it just seems like it keeps getting crazier. And we've just got a few more weeks, and you just wonder if, if the fourth quarter is going to be tough, right? I mean, if, 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 if there's going to be more things coming. And sadly, it may be. But here's the thing. Especially when we're going through hard times, God has given us who he calls a wonderful counselor. Do you guys know who that is? It's Jesus. And Jesus then, in turn, after he came and did what he was doing here on earth and died for our sins, he promised a counselor to come in addition to him, and that was the Holy Spirit, and that is the Holy Spirit. But God gives us counsel. What does that mean? What does it mean to have counsel? Well, we all, no matter what we're going through, no matter whether things are good, whether things are bad, whether we're the most talkative person in the world or whether we barely ever say a word, we all are built to need someone to talk to. We're all built to need someone to listen to us and someone to, when they listen to us and as they love us, to give us good advice and to help us deal with the things that we're dealing with. Now, you guys and girls, you know that you have those folks in your parents and in your brothers and sisters almost all the time, right? You have, you have folks in your life, you have teachers and maybe coaches, and you have people here at our church that teach Sunday school, that lead children's choir, that, that, that do all kinds of activities. You've got people who will listen to you, and when you ever have a problem that you'd like to talk to anybody about, you can go to those people. But do you know what? We can only help you as much as we can help you. God also is that counselor for you. Jesus himself is our counselor, and he's there to hear from us, and he wants to hear from us. Don't ever think that Jesus is too busy to hear what you're going through. Don't ever think that he's too busy to hear when you're excited and celebrating something or when you're struggling and having a hard time with something. He died on the cross to show just how much he loves you and how much he loves me. And he always is here to listen. So we can talk to him in prayer. And you say, well, wait a minute, I don't know if he's listening. He assures us, he promises us 
that he's listening to everything we say. And in fact, he knows it even before we say it to him, but he still wants to hear it from us. So I encourage you guys, use the folks in your life that you have to talk to. And don't forget that Jesus is also there to be your counselor. Let's pray together this morning. Lord God, we're thankful that you love us. We're thankful this morning that you care for us and that you sent Jesus to the cross to die for our sins and that you rose him again on that third day that, that we might not have to fear all the things that come with sin, but we see that you're powerful over it all. God, we thank you that in the midst of all of that power and in the midst of our salvation and our opportunity for salvation, God, you give us and you are our counselor. Lord, God, as we talk about that later on this morning in the sermon and as we live our lives, help us to always rely on you. Help us to always share with you what you already know is on our heart, but thank you that you want to hear it from our very voices and from our very hearts as well. Lord, God, this morning, help us to, to not miss the wonderful counselor that you are to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, this morning we're going to continue singing. Uh, nobody ran out of the room, so, well, I don't know, Bruce did a minute ago, but he's okay, I hope. Hopefully it wasn't because of my singing. So anyway, well, let's, uh, let's worship the Lord together with all hail the power of Jesus' name. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem. And crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransom for the fall. I'm off. <laughs> oh, 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 here we go. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throne we at his feet may fall. song and crown him Lord of all we'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all and now if you'd stand with us as we sing together holy holy holy
seated. Let us pray. Our fathers, we come to this portion of our service, Father, where we offer up our tithes and offerings. We just pray, Lord, that you will instill in our hearts, Father, to do as, as we see fit to do in our own families. And, Father, we just know that these tithes and offerings, Father, we just lift them up to you and just pray that you'll take them and use them as you see fit here at our church. And Father, as well as this offering and tithes, we just lift up those that are in our church this morning, Father, that are hurting. Father, the dear family. Father, our church and our community has lost a pillar of our, our church, Father, and we just lift them up to you and just pray that you'll just, in some form or fashion, touch them. Father, just comfort them during these times. We have so many more that are sick in our community. I lift them and their families up to you as well. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Folks, I'm going to call a bit of an audible. Guys, I'm gonna, we're going to skip this last song, if that's okay, ladies. Uh, I'm sorry, I wanted to make, to make sure we took a moment to, uh, to lift up the Deer family together this morning. Um, as many of you have heard, Miss Betty Deer passed away a little after 7.30 this morning. And uh, it's been a, uh, uh, just a, a very tough year, and more than that, but especially this year uh, with all that's been going on and, and her continuing illness and her decline. Um, uh, just been a terrible, terrible time for them. Uh, we know Mr. JP and Eric and Chet and all of their family uh, have been expecting this for some time. Um, sadly, that's part of the diagnosis she was given many, 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 many months ago. Um, and, uh, but it doesn't make it, even though they were expecting it, it doesn't make it any easier. Um, it hurts just as much to lose a mom, a grandmother, uh, even a great-grandmother. And, uh, and so we want to we'll just have a moment this morning to, to pray for them together. Um, and to lift them up. Of course, during COVID times, uh, ordinarily, if it was quote-unquote normal times, we'd all take you know, the appropriate time and go and visit with them and things like that. COVID makes that tough, and that's one of the things that hurts our heart about this, these times in which we're living. Uh, but I would encourage you as these days and, and weeks come, uh, as you continue to pray for the family, uh, that you would take a chance to, to visit appropriately, to maybe uh, share a meal, whatever uh, is needed. I'm sure that we'll be putting out some information and, and getting some things organized to help them out. Um, and, uh, but especially for Mr. JP, uh, as he uh, has lost the, the love of his life, and uh, one that he has done uh, so much to care for after she did so much for a long time to care for him. And, uh, but, uh, but continue to pray also for Eric and Chet and their families as well. Let's, uh, let's go to Lord in prayer this morning. Father God, we love you. And Lord God, we are thankful that uh, Lord, you are, you are on your throne. And God, because you're on your throne and you have shown yourself throughout eternity to be trustworthy, God, we can take comfort 
in the times in which our hearts hurt. And God, our hearts hurt right now in the loss of Miss Betty Deer, one who was such a pillar in our church for so many years, who did so many things in our community, uh, and who, who did so well with her family as well. Lord God, we, th we thank you, Lord, that above all else, we know that she trusted Jesus as her Savior many, many years ago. And so this morning, we don't have to question where she will spend eternity. And if we have also put our faith in Jesus, we don't have to question whether or not we'll see her again. But Lord God, this morning, we know that our hearts are grieving, and even more so, her family's hearts are grieving. So Lord, would you bring comfort in our time of loss? There's so many that are sick right now, so many that are struggling with COVID and so many other deals in their lives that they didn't ask for, but they're dealing with day by day. God, would you help us in all of these situations, as well as with, with the loss of Miss Betty, to trust you more and more, to know that you are on your throne, and to know that what you do is always good. We sometimes often don't understand it, but Father, it's always good, and we trust that this morning. We praise you, we celebrate you because of who you are. Not because you make us feel good, but because you are perfect, you are holy, you are creator and sustainer, God. So, Lord God, accept our worship this morning and all that we've sung and our prayers, our time now to listen to your word. And, Father, also help us to worship you as we serve the dear family and many others who are struggling. We love you, Lord. We thank you that you have sent us Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Of course, as you continue to lift them up, uh, remember all those that are quarantining and struggling with COVID right now. It's just, uh, uh, we don't know what these weeks, we, we didn't know that these weeks would be the way they've been, uh, and we don't know what the coming weeks will, uh, will hold. I want you to please pray for our deacons and our church leadership as, uh, as we'll be meeting this afternoon for our regular scheduled monthly deacons meeting, but we will be discussing what's the best thing for us to do. Um, and this decision, whatever God leads us to, he will lead us to it. Um, I, I, I tell you what, you know, the, those weeks and months that we spent not being able to meet were, were tough. They were painful not to see people's faces and to get to be with you and even to, you know, give a, a, an air high five from six feet away or more and all those things that we do during, you know, social distancing and whatnot. Uh, but at the same time, you notice that this morning we're missing so many of our folks, and, and I've had several folks tell me that, well, they, you know, they're going to be watching the stream, which I hate it's not working this morning just yet, but, um, but they, they just didn't feel comfortable coming in. Uh, so we want to do whatever, the, whatever God leads us to do first and foremost, and second only to that, we want to do what is best to protect our church and each other. So pray for us, pray that God would, would continue to do what only he can do, and that is to l deliver us through this crazy situation and this crazy year. He's still, again, on his throne, and uh, he's not surprised by any of this. Uh, in fact, he knew it was coming, and he had already made provision for it. Uh, and that's what we start to talk about this morning in a brand new series that we'll be going through, Lord willing, for the month of December. And it's called, To Us a Child is Born. We know that throughout Scripture, uh, in the Old Testament, God was laying the, the path, laying the, the, the groundwork, so to speak, so that people, his people, his creative people, would know their need for a Savior. That, that, that we, as we look back and as we study the Old Testament, so that we would know our need for a Savior. That we would be able to look through and see the, the, the holiness of God, the power of God, the almightiness of God, and see that we don't measure up to that, no matter how much we might puff ourselves up or how capable we might think ourselves to be. He is far above, far greater, and, and, and he is the only one that is perfect, so therefore he's far more perfect than we are. And, and when he, we see that, we also see that because of that, his character is holy. And he has expectations that those who would believe in him, those that would follow him, those would, that would indeed be his people, would also be holy. And so he gave the law. And the law showed the absolute perfection and character of God himself and showed that we on our own, apart from him, we have no hope of being able to keep all of the law. We have no hope of being able to avoid sin in our lives. And so throughout the, the time of the law, up until the time where he chose to give us Jesus, people were, were frustrated, people were struggling, they were confused. Sometimes they thought they were keeping all the law, but then you could just see in their lives that there was, well, what about this one, and what about that one, and you forgot totally about this whole section, and so on and so forth. God, throughout the Old Testament, pointed out that we could not honor him on our own. We couldn't do it. And this morning, in 2020, so many thousands of years after he gave the law, 
We've got to make sure that we understand that this thing that we call Christianity is not just simply something we ourselves do. It's not just a system of beliefs that we've decided fits our thoughts and fits our, uh, our, you know, meets our agreement, and so we've said, okay, that's what we're going to do, and so I choose to do all this type of stuff, and I choose to pray and worship and all this stuff. If we're doing it by ourselves, if we're doing it apart from the power of God in our lives, it's nothing. It's, it's just another action. It's just another activity. It's, it's like playing soccer or playing cards with friends or going to work. I mean, it's just another daily activity. Everybody does daily activities. But none of us on our own can have a right relationship with God by ourselves. And that's where what we celebrate that we know of as Christmas becomes so important. Because Christmas every year, and as we think about it throughout the year, it's not just about gifts that we give one another or receive from one another. It's not about, just about Santa Claus and Christmas trees and all the festivities. It celebrates the moment. It celebrates the action that God took to say, you can't do it on your own, and now you don't have to do it on your own. Because the gift, the best gift of Christmas, as we've said so many times before, and as we say often enough to where sometimes maybe we even take it for granted, the true gift of Christmas is Jesus himself. God gave his own son that we might be able to know him. Even though we couldn't overcome our sin by ourselves, even though we couldn't honor God by ourselves on our own, he sent Christ into this world, and Christ went willingly, came willingly into this world so that he could do what needed to be done. And he has called us to put our faith fully, truly, and squarely in him. And when that happens, it's no longer, uh, we don't save ourselves. He truly saves us. Sometimes I think because we, we've had so many years in all of our lives that we've heard about how much Jesus loves us and we're, we're very familiar, most of us, with the story of what he's done. And those of us who aren't as familiar, we're getting more familiar because we have the scriptures. We have an opportunity to hear about it. Sometimes I think that we've, we just always have felt that and always have known some of that and heard about that, that sometimes we, we forget how desperate the situation was before Jesus was here. And the first verse, actually, that is, is the theme for this, for this uh, series that we're looking at called To Us as a Child is Born is from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. I won't ask you to rise for this verse, but we'll rise. Uh, well, actually, no, you can stay seated for this one. I'll, I'll ask you to rise in just a moment when we read a full, a full passage. Sorry, Grady. I gave you, gave you a false start there. Uh, but in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, we, we hear from the prophet Isaiah and from God himself. He says, For to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, 6 gave a promise that was being promised throughout history at that point that there would be a Savior. And he describes him throughout the Old Testament prophets in so many ways. God tells us what the Savior will be like. And at that point, even in the, in the hopelessness of trying to fulfill the law themselves, they looked eagerly forward to this Savior coming. And that Savior is Jesus. And so this month, this, this, uh, this holiday season, this Christmas time that we celebrate, we get to celebrate the fulfillment of this promise. We get to celebrate that he has sent us a son. To us, a son has been born. And he was born many years ago, and he lived a perfect life. It says the government will be on his shoulders. Is that just talking about that he'd be ruling a country or a people? No, it's that he rules the entire earth. It all hinges upon what Jesus does. Anything that is good in us comes from the gift of Jesus, because anything that is good from us is only brought to us by his presence in our life this morning. And so I want to encourage you this morning as we look through these four names, these four characterizations, these four descriptions over these next four weeks of Jesus. This morning, beginning with Wonderful Counselor, understand that we're talking about the most important person in history. The only person who had flesh and on his own was holy. The only one who didn't need anybody else to honor God the Father. And that's Jesus. He's also the only one we can put our trust and our faith in this morning to be saved and to live a life that glorifies God. 
Now, to look at him as wonderful counselor this morning, I will ask you now to rise with me as we take a look at John chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. We'll read on through verse 8. And John writes, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which is in, Ar in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been uh, an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? So the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool. When the water is stirred, while I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Please be seated. We see here another wonderful miracle that Jesus works. We see here another life radically changed because of Jesus interacting with him. You know, just like today, people believe a lot of things, don't they? We believe in conspiracy theories. We believe in shadow things and all. We believe, we believe in some crazy stuff sometimes, don't we? There's all kinds of things that we believe in that are reasonable, and there's a whole lot of things we believe in that aren't. How many of you still don't step on a crack so you don't break your mother's back, right? Right? I mean, that's a silly, that sounds like a silly kid's thing, but I guarantee you there's some reasonable, you know, working adults out there that still don't step on cracks, you know. Uh, we have superstitions, you know, you, you spill the salt and what do you do with it? Don't you supposed to throw it over your shoulder, isn't that how that works? You break a mirror, you get seven years of bad luck. I mean, these, these are things that people actually believe. We're like, no, this is 2020, we're sophisticated, we, we don't believe in it. Yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, this afternoon, many of you will watch NFL football, and there'll be guys on there that have the same socks on that they played in in their rookie years because they, they, they're superstitious about it. I mean, it, we believe some crazy stuff. Well, that's exactly what was going on here. Uh, the, the, these people at this pool in the city near the Sheep Gate, um, they, they believed that when the water would bubble or when the water would be disturbed or would stir, they believed that it was an angel stirring the water and that whoever the first person with a problem to get into the water once it was stirred, however often it was stirred, that they'd be healed. Now, we don't get much explanation. You might have noticed a minute ago as we were reading through the passage that, that in the New International Version, we don't read, there is no verse 4. Um, and verse 4 in other transcripts and other manuscripts um, say that, that they explain that, that that's what they believe. They believe that an angel of the Lord came and would stir the water and whoever was first into the pool would be saved. You say, well, why? Why is verse 4 out of there? The New International Version folks just decided to pull a verse out? Well, it's all based on the manuscripts that they had available to them that were not available in earlier translations. We won't get into that debate. The point of the matter is, is that that is just a, a, a word of explanation. It does not change what Jesus did, and it certainly doesn't change who Jesus is to not have that verse in there. But in case you were wondering, that's what was going on with verse 4. But here these people are. Jesus comes in. As, as we saw just the other day, talking about Jesus' earthly parents, Mary and Joseph, being consistent, Jesus continued to be consistent in living out his faith and showing us how to live out our faith because he celebrated the festivals. And we read in, in verse 1 that sometime later Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. So he was doing what he normally did. He was traveling around. In the times that there weren't festivals to be celebrated, he was going around the countryside, going all around the area, and he was teaching them with great authority, with great power. He was healing their sick, their sick casting out demons. He was doing all of these things, and people had been giving and continued to give him their attention. Well, in verse 2, we see that now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool. And, and John writes, there is, because people would have still been able to go to that pool in the time that he wrote. He said in Aramaic, it's called Bethesda, uh, also known as Bethsaida, and many other translations uh, of that name, and says, and it's surrounded by five covered colonnades. Well, why is that important? Well, it just lets you know that that's an established place. Colonnades would not have been built around a pool unless somebody thought that pool was important. 
And one of the importance is, we don't know if the colonnades were built because of the idea of this angel stirring the water and the healing power or whatever that was going on there in the water. We don't know if that's why the colonnades were built or if the colonnades were built for some other purpose. That's okay. We don't have to know that, but we just know that this was a, a recognized situation. This was a recognized place. And it says in verse 3, here a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. And then and after that that omitted verse 4 that explains what was going on there, we see about this particular man. But before we talk about him specifically, let's just make sure we understand uh, the first truth this morning. And that is, is that Jesus understands our situation. Right? I mean, Jesus understands exactly what we're going through. Sometimes when we struggle, sometimes when we're living our individual lives, it's easy for us to think that we're the only one that's ever experienced what we're experiencing. And it's easy in that to be tempted to feel very alone, very defeated, sometimes very bitter, very angry. But one of the great things about the gift of Jesus Christ is that he didn't do all the work of salvation from up in heaven. He stepped down and took on flesh. He became a, a human person. He had been an eternal spiritual person, but he took on flesh. He chose to come and literally walk in our shoes. He chose to come and experience life, all the good and all the bad that we experience, just like us. It would have been very simple. He could have done, he could have snapped his fingers or even thought about snapping his fingers in heaven and, and sin could have been defeated just like it was on the cross. But he showed his character and his desire and, and showed who he is and how he did go about the plan of saving us. And so what did he do? He came and he was born as a baby. We were talking the other day with some folks about how, you know, about, about going back to different parts of our lives, right? And somebody said, you know, I would, I'd be sure I'd go back to high school and have a good fun time there, but you couldn't pay me enough money to go back to middle school. Middle schoolers, is that true? Do you feel that right now? Or are you having, like, you're living your best life now? Maybe so. I don't know. But middle school sometimes can be tough. And we've all got parts of our life that we'd love to go back and relive. And we've probably all got parts of our life that we wouldn't want to go back and relive. I can only imagine that it had to have been of the utmost importance that Jesus understood our whole situation that would make him go and be born as a baby. Can you imagine the humility that Jesus himself showed to be born as a baby and still be Almighty God? That blows my mind this morning. And every time I think about it, it's just, it, it amazes me. Jesus has gone to lengths that we could never go to to understand our situation. And I would contend to you this morning that he understands your situation and my situation more than we do because he's greater than us. He's smarter than us. He knows more than us. He hears and sees more than us and he understands at a deeper level than we ever will this side of heaven. This morning, Jesus understands our situation. There's nobody in this room, there's nobody that will watch the video of our service on the internet later on. There's no one who will ever live that is truly alone. And there's no one who ever can say that God hasn't paid attention to them because we see at time after time after time and throughout time that that's exactly what God does. He does pay attention to us. He does understand our situation. He literally has been there and he's done that. Jesus understands our situation. This morning, whatever you're going through in the, the latter stage of 2020, and Lord knows, we're all, we're all going through things that we didn't expect to be going through at this point in our lives. Um, I, I think about some of the things that I look back over the year, just you know, kind of the things I was thinking about what this year was to hold for our church and where we were going. None of us had any idea that it would look like this by December, right? None of us did. And so that makes it just feel even worse in a lot of ways. Hopefully it helps us to realize that we are more blessed than we probably realized back at the early part of 2020 before we dealt with all this. But it still weighs on us heavy because of all that's going on. No matter what that situation or our part in this situation of the world is as it is today, no matter what it is, Jesus understands. He understands. He is, as Isaiah told us, our wonderful counselor. Now, I know for a lot of us in America, when we hear about a counselor, when we have someone suggest to us, well, hey, maybe you should go talk to somebody, we look at that in some very strange taboo ways, don't we? 
we, we think, well, no, 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 I'm not crazy, right? I'm, I, I, don't need, I don't need to go to a counselor. No, no, I got this. I, you know, it's, I, just, I just need to work harder. I just need to pull myself up by my bootstraps and things like that. Well, guess what? There is nothing wrong. In fact, there's everything right to having a trusted person to talk to. And we see that because Jesus is our wonderful counselor, and he set that example. I would encourage you that there are things that you will go through in this life that you can always, all of them you can talk to Jesus, but there's some things in your life that you need to go talk to an objective party about. Certainly talk to Jesus, but understand that in addition to him being our wonderful counselor, he has put some, some pretty good counselors, not as good as him, but some pretty good counselors in our path as well. And we ought to take that as an opportunity, not look at it as some you know, badge of shame or, or something that makes us less than. The fact that Jesus has created the family shows us that we all need to have somebody to talk to. That's why, that's why when, we, when we see someone who has been widowed, it, it's sad because now they don't have that person in their life, right? They don't have that, that one that's been with them many times for a lot of years to, to be that sounding board, to be that voice of reason, to be that voice of encouragement, sometimes that voice of correction. Uh, we, it, it's sad to see that because we're built to have that. And Jesus meets all of our needs, including being our counselor. No matter who you talk to, it's better when you talk to someone who understands your situation. And because Jesus understands your situation and my situation every time, every situation, better than anyone could. He, that's why he's a wonderful counselor. And that wonderful doesn't mean like, hey, how are you doing today? Wonderful. <laughs> you know, we, we, we fake that a lot, don't we? Oh, I'm doing great. No, it means wonderful meaning he is an amazing, an awe-inspiring counselor, and he is the only one who is, the, who is at that level of counsel for us. He understands our situation. And so when we talk to other people, when we have other counselors in life, we need to make sure that we help them understand our situation. Jesus deals with us in truth throughout all of our situations. He understands them, and so what we hear from his word and what we hear from what he does in guiding us in our lives, we get the best advice, the best uh, commandments in some cases that we can get. So for this man, it says in verse 5 here that, that uh, we, uh, there was a man who had been there as an invalid, or who had been an invalid, for 38 years. This man that day is lying by the pool. He's lying like many people who could not fully function physically would. He's got a mat, dirty, dusty, not, not comfortable in any way, and he's literally lying on the mat so that he wouldn't be lying on the stone floor. And so he's, he's, he's sitting there, he's unable to walk, might have even have a, had other ailments as well, including possibly blindness. And his only hope at this point, his situation is, he is waiting to hear uh, and to see or, or, or to understand that the water's been disturbed and then do everything he can to get there. Have you guys ever had a claustrophobic moment? A few of you have. Uh, I, this is something that as I've gotten a little bit older, I'm not that old, but as I've gotten a little bit older, it kind of happens to me um, every once in a while. Just, I mean, just uh, maybe two or three times in my whole life. One time, though, was actually this summer when I had COVID. And, and I put my CPAP mask on to sleep, and I fell asleep and drifted off. And I, in my dream, I just, I, I don't even know what the dream was, but I had to get out. I was, I was stuck. I was, I was confined. I was having that claustrophobic moment. And y'all, I'm, I'm thankful that I didn't destroy my CPAP machine and mask in the midst of ripping that thing off my head. I mean, it pulled my nose up. I mean, <laughs> it was not pretty in, that, in, in the bed that night. But that moment of when you're having that, that moment of claustrophobia and, and you're like, man, I, I got to get out. And you will do anything to get out. That's what this man's situation was. This was that's what this invalid's life was. He would get brought to that pool if he didn't stay there the whole time throughout each day anyway. He didn't, we don't understand that he has a whole lot of people that are helping him. And so his only hope, and that moment, as soon as he understood that the water had been disturbed, it was a mad dash in every bit of limited ability he had to get up and get to the pool. That's where this man was. He'd been an invalid for 38 years. And Jesus, as he came to that place, understood that. In verse 6 we read, When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Man, what a question. 
Sounds like a no-brainer, doesn't it? Here this man is in the situation that he can't get to the pool and, and, and has, has tremendous physical limitations and is struggling with hope and he's struggling with all the, you know, the possibilities of what he's going to miss out on and what he has missed out on for almost 40 years at this point. His situation was dire. His situation felt in many ways hopeless and the only thing he wanted to do was to get well. When Jesus sees that he's there, knows his situation, he asks him, what seems like a ludicrous question, right? Do you want to get well? I can just see the guy, if he was a little snarky like we are a lot of times in 2020, he'd be like, no, no, I'm just sitting here because, you know, it's, it's great scenery, right? You know, do I want to get well? No, I just really like the smell of this pool and all these sick people around me. I mean, can you imagine some of the comments that, that, that might, would come to this? I mean, when someone in your family, someone you love dearly asks a stupid question, how do you respond, right? I, I wish I respond better, responded better than I do. That's a, that's a, a downfall on my part. And uh, my girls will tell you about that. <laughs> but, but this question, do you want to get well, came out of Jesus understanding this man's heart and giving him an opportunity. Can you imagine the other people around this man when Jesus asked this question? Because we get the idea, uh, as John writes it, that there were many people that were around uh, the pool there. It wasn't just this guy. Um, in fact, he's going to, in response to Jesus' question of whether he gets well, or wants to get well, he's going to throw up an excuse about there being more people around than, that keep him from getting there. In fact, let's take a look at that right now. It says uh, in, uh, in verse 7, he says, Sir, answering this question of do you want to get well, Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Do we do that with Jesus sometimes? Do you know this morning that he's asking us in the midst of the situations that we're in that he understands? He's asking us, well, do you want to get well? Do you want to be made right? Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to know and trust that there's more to this life than what you're struggling with right now? Do you want to know that you don't have to fear a terrible physical diagnosis from a doctor? Do you want to know that you don't have to wonder where you'll spend eternity after you breathe your last breath here? He asks us all the time. Throughout his word, he asks us, do you want to get well? That question is out to us. So many times we kind of go through life and you know, we try to do our best and we try to fix our problems and you know, get everything straight. And then if we can't do it, what do we do? Oh, Lord, I've done everything I can. Why don't you help me? Maybe we'll just give you a last-ditch effort to, you know, to come in and save me. He's asking us every day, knowing and understanding our situation, do you want to get well? Sometimes when we talk to him, we do the same thing as the man did. We throw up some excuses, don't we? Oh, well, I know, I know Jesus could save me, but, but, but I've done too much, or I haven't done enough. Well, I, I, I know that, you know, that the, the worshiping God and being a part of a church is important, but, you know, I, I've been hurt by church. Uh, people, people have been mean to me in church. They didn't like me for whatever reason. They made me feel bad or didn't talk to me, whatever. So I, I, don't, I, I don't believe in all that stuff. The only person that can help us ask us, do we want to be well? And oftentimes, we throw up excuses. Sometimes our excuse is, I don't know enough about you. Sometimes our excuse is, I'm good. I'm enjoying my life just like it is, even though we know we have times where we're not enjoying our life the way it is, when we have times where we realize our shortcomings, when we realize how far, how, how far we fall short of living the life that we could be living. We give excuses all the time. As our wonderful counselor, Jesus challenges our excuses. He challenges our excuses. And, and for this man, when he said to him, well, I, I don't have anybody to help me, and so I can't get there, uh, you know the man wasn't just saying, well, you know, I just don't have anybody to help me. You know he's just frustrated. Can you imagine that he, he understands that people probably in his mind have been healed because of getting into the water, and he can't get there. And it's got to be the first. That, that's why I believe that, uh, that, that, you know, this whole idea may not have been actually an angel of God. It may have been a superstition, because why would God make it a competition. This morning, your response to God has nothing to do with who else has come to Jesus before you. It's not about whether you're the last one in your family, or the first one in your family, the last one in our church, or the first one in our church to come to Jesus. It's about that you come to Jesus. 
It doesn't sound like this whole idea of the first person in the water once the, once the angel has stirred the water. It seemed like that was really of God. I don't know that for sure. That's just my opinion. But God is, is one who gives us, through Christ, all oh, an equal opportunity, more equal than we will ever know in any other part of life, to come to him and to be saved. And this man says, I, I can't get there. People get there in front of me. And Jesus can, he challenges his, his excuse, and he says to him, very simply, says, Jesus said to him in verse 8, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. Boy, there's so many places in Scripture where Jesus does the same thing. When Peter's saying, Lord, I know the water's stormy and the boat's being rocked and here you are walking to us like a ghost on the water. Hey, if it's really you, why don't you tell me to come out there? And Jesus says, come on. And Peter's stuck, right? <laughs> That's a familiar passage to us that Peter has a decision to make because now all the excuses are gone. Same thing with this man. We stopped reading at verse 8, but what we find out is, is that indeed, he got up, took his mat, and he walked. He didn't let those excuses get in the way anymore. Jesus had challenged the excuse and said, well, that's good. Why don't you just get on up and walk? And then Jesus worked a miracle in his life. Do you know this morning that if your excuses are keeping you from putting your faith in Jesus or living your faith in Jesus, that he's just saying, hey, why not this morning? Why not today? Why not get over all of the, the religion in your life and actually have a relationship with me? Why not come and say, okay, Jesus, I'm yours. I read in your scripture, you're, you're speaking to my heart, telling me that I need more, that I need different, that I need you. I'm yours. That's the equivalent to this man being told by Jesus, get up and walk, and him doing it. And that can happen for any, for each of us this morning who have not put our faith in Jesus yet. The only reason Jesus can do this is because Jesus has the power and the solution. He has the power not only to understand the problem, but to understand the way out of the problem. He has the power not only to know our situation, but to know the solution. He has the power to be the solution. And he says to us constantly through his word and through the Holy Spirit's work in our lives of convicting us and guiding us and pointing us to him. He tells us, look, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no person comes to the Father but through me. This morning, Jesus not only has the power and the solution, but he is the solution to your situation and to my situation and to our situation. We put our faith and our hope in a lot of things. We put our hope and our faith in, in election results in the people who take office or don't take office. We put our faith in the people around us for so many different things. We put our faith in so much, in so many that are less than Jesus. Why would we not this morning, knowing that he has given himself to us and is our wonderful counselor, and he, he obliterates our excuses and gives us the solution, why would we live another minute not trusting in him this morning? This morning, I encourage you in just a moment as we have our time of invitation, would you come? If God's speaking to you this morning and saying, this is for you. This is the message that you needed to hear this morning because you may have been in church a long time or you may not have, but you've not given me your life. You've not trusted in this Jesus who is the promised Savior and this wonderful Counselor, this mighty God, this everlasting Father and Prince of Peace, as Isaiah tells us. This morning, the opportunity that Jesus gives to you is to be made new, to get up out of this situation or these situations you find yourself in, and to be healed, to be made whole, to be forgiven, to be saved. Whatever is going on in your life, there's nothing that you're facing that Jesus can't handle, and whether he changes the situation itself, he absolutely will change you in the situation. So I, I beg you this morning, don't let another day go past. If you've not put your faith in Jesus, let today be the day that you do. This morning, for a lot of us, we've done that. We've, we've maybe even walked this very aisle or talked to a preacher or a trusted minister here uh, in the front of this church, and we've been saved, and, but yet we still so many times find ourselves pulling our control for our situations and our solutions for our situations back to ourselves and taking it, we think, out of Jesus' hands. And we then find ourselves struggling and just spiraling and, and, and spinning our wheels in so many ways and life is so frustrating because of it. If that's you this morning, you've put your faith in Jesus, you've been saved, 
You've been made to walk again like this invalid was. Maybe this morning you say, God, help me to walk right. God, bring me back to a pure faith in you. Bring me back to a, a, a true trust in you and let me live out the salvation that you gave me maybe years ago. But God, let me do it in a way that is submissive to you and that honors you in everything. Maybe you want to pray for something specifically, you can absolutely come to this open altar and pray. If you want to come and talk to me, come and talk to me. We'll pray together and we'll, if we need to, we'll set up some time to talk even after this service for as much as you need. Whatever God is telling you you need this morning, understand that he is the solution. <laughs> he's the one. No matter what you think you need, he's going to show you as you open your heart to him that he is the one you need. So however you need to experience him this morning, as we sing our time of invitation, would you come? Let's pray together this morning. Lord God, we're so thankful for your grace. We don't deserve for you to deal with us in any way other than to shame us. But you choose to love us. And that's amazing to us this morning. Lord God, help us to understand who you are. Help us to put our faith in Jesus, to be made whole, to be made well, to be made, uh, after having been an invalid, to be able to walk and to walk well in you. Lord God, for those who need to be saved this morning, would you let us put our faith in you and trust you with all of our hearts? And would you save us even now? And Lord God, for all of us who have done that, for all of us who will do that, would you help us to live out a life that serves you? We love you, Lord. We trust you. Let us respond to you in worship even now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now this morning as we lead our invitation, it's going to be very difficult for me to both sing and to receive. So I'm going to step down and receive. And so as the musicians play, uh, as God leads you, would you stand with us? If you'd like to sing the lyrics, if you know the song, go right ahead. But you respond in worship as God calls you. going to come for a little while, and I'm thankful that today's the day. Start, I couldn't think of a better way to start off December than to have two young folks come and, and share with us as a church and to make a public profession that they have trusted Jesus with their hearts, and they have been saved, and now they're making it public. And we're so excited about Anna Claire Barlow and Brant Barlow. So glad that they are part of our family here. Thankful for Ken and Kitty and the great family that they lead. And uh, we're so thankful for the two of them this morning and looking forward to being able to celebrate with them. So as we wrap up our service this morning, in just a moment, you, uh, yeah, I know you can't maybe come by and give hugs and all the fun stuff we normally do, but come and, and speak to these two great guys and girls, or great guy and girl, uh, and, uh, and let them know how excited you are that they have been saved and uh, that they also are desiring to join Harrisville Baptist Church. So uh, can we have a motion that they be received? All right, any second out there somewhere? All right, all those in favor say amen. amen. All those opposed, I'll see you out back in just a minute. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Guys, we're so proud of you. I'm going to get you to sit down there for just, just a second, and then at the end we'll just have you be up here and let folks come by and talk to you. We couldn't be more pleased when people give their lives to Christ, and we're thankful that he does so through ministering through our church and through their, our families and through our, our, our world. Guys, God is at work. It's so strange right now, but he's still working. So I encourage you, whatever he's doing in your heart, don't hold back. Don't try to keep him from doing too much. Let him do what only he can do. Um, we've got a great afternoon going right now. Everything's, uh, I know a lot of people ask, well, hey, are we, are we having church? We're not having church. As of right now, our full schedule is still open, um, and we're doing so. Obviously, if you don't feel comfortable coming and being amongst people, uh, if you're watching this later on and you don't feel comfortable, we totally understand that. Uh, we want to make sure that we're, we're meeting people where they are, but we don't want to, to keep people from coming who would like to come as well. So right now, as I asked you at the beginning of the service, 
please pray for our deacons and our, our leadership this afternoon as we meet together and see what we need to do in the coming weeks and just go from there. Pray for each of those men because this is not a thing where I'm going to go in and tell them what we're going to do. This is going to be a thing where we all have been listening to God, we've been seeking his will in it, and we're going to talk about, okay, where is he bringing us? And we're excited to see God bring us together in that in a way that will minister to you well. Uh, this morning, we have, uh, we're thankful that, that we have had folks to be visiting with us this morning. Uh, I promise you the music, uh, of course, these guys are always great, but the singing part is usually way better. So if you, if you came this, this morning, you're like, I ain't going to that church. That dude can't sing. We are uh, we're in the process of hunting for someone to help us lead music as well as many other things in our church. So uh, bear with us. But, uh, but praise the Lord that, that it doesn't matter what we sound like sometimes, uh, that we can still praise the Lord this morning. Uh, you guys got a special rehearsal? Okay. Okay, so both Sundays, this Sunday and next Sunday, children's choir at 4.30. And then, oh, the Sunday, it's, when do you need them there that day? Gotcha. gotcha. Okay, all right. So for sure we know today, 4.30 today, and then Miss Stephanie will get the information. I, I'm sure I butchered that. Sorry about that. But, um, and uh, we're looking forward to that. As of right now, everything is go. The soup and chili fund, or fundraiser fellowship that we have, uh, it'll look a little different, but right now we're still planning to have it as of this morning. We'll see how that goes. Again, we want to make sure we do things safely. Uh, but right now, if, you, uh, if you've got that soup and chili recipe, kind of dust it off and kind of have it on standby, ready to go. All right? Well, we love to, uh, to sing as we dismiss, and I uh, hope that you all have a great and wonderful afternoon. And if you choose to come back this evening at 5 uh, or 4.30 if you're in the children's choir, we'd love to see you then. Uh, thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Let's sing together as we dismiss. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Declare to know that you love them and that you're excited for them.